All right, we have three. I haven't heard from Tim or Lauren. Um, hmm. I take it you're not on Sugarloaf, Maureen. <laughs> no, it would be nice, but it no. would be. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. I like the, oh, here's Tim. There's Tim. But let's see, is Lauren here yet? All right. I'll wait another minute and see. Oh, there's Lauren. Oh, there's Lauren. Hi, Hi Lauren. Hi. Hi. Okay, great. Fantastic. So, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Governor Healy, this meeting of the Board of Health will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so by following the instructions on the Board of Health's posted agenda and via Zoom or by posted telephone numbers available on our website. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access proceedings in real time via technological means. We will post on the Board of Health website a recording of the proceedings as soon as technologically possible after the meeting. All approved minutes of the Board of Health meetings are also posted on our website. So I will now open the um, May 11th Board of Health meeting at 532 with a roll call. So Lauren, I see you first on my, can you say here? Uh, okay. Tim? Here. Premola? Here. Maureen? Here. And Nancy? I got everybody, didn't I? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So the first um, item on our agenda is to review the minutes from March 9th and then March 13th. So March 9th, um, Maureen, Lauren, Pramila, uh, and I were at the meeting and Tim was absent. So if anyone has any Comments. I I didn't see anything with that one that was I thought was a problem. And I have a motion to accept the minutes. I can move to accept the minutes of the March meeting. I'll okay. second. Okay, so all in favor. Premila? Aye. Maureen? Aye. Lauren? And Nancy I. Now we'll move to the May, I mean, April 13th minutes. Well, there's a problem with who was here. Oh, right. Yes, because Tim is not here. there and he was there. Yeah. So that's one, let's see. Oh, someone has a, uh, okay. And it's confusing about Lauren here too. <laughs> She's on both not here and here. <laughs> so, oh yeah, Lauren was abs not there. That's right. And Tim was there. So that's one. Any other? I had two. I, I didn't see anything else. One was on uh, number C, C under old business. I had also made a comment 
um, that I had asked for either a board of health or health department representative to attend the July 18th resource fair um, by the Affordable Housing Trust. It's at Bengs Community Center. Um, Cause I will no longer be on the board mm -hmm. and I will be going to the June 20th meet, uh, listening session focus group. And then under other topics, um, where it says, I reminded members that having more than three people on the board is important because two people are, are um, terms are expiring on the 30th of June. Anything else? Okay, so may have a motion to accept the amended minutes. I'll move to accept the minutes amended as described for April 13th, 2023. I'll I second. second. Oh, okay, you're seconding it, Tim? Yep. Great. Okay, all in favor, Tim? Aye. Maureen? Aye. And Nancy? Aye. Okay. So now... We go to public comments, and during the public comment period, um, I as chair will recognize and Kyle will let people whose hands are raised, um, uh, members of the public to express their views for up to two minutes. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name, preferred pronouns, and residential address. Um, the Board of Health will not engage in dialogue or comment on any matter raised during the public comment. Thank you, and I will open it up to public comment, and I see two hands, three hands raised. Um, I know that Heather Warner and Lisa Stevens, good night, are members of the Hampshire Franklin Tobacco Free Community Partnership. And they'd like to speak and possibly come back at another meeting um, to talk more about um, their roles and their work. So if we want to let Heather in and then Lisa. So Kyle. Can you let Heather in? Yeah, in the process, sorry. Okay, great. Hi, good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me in a while for a minute. I um, just, wanna, just wanna say, um, to thank Heather for coming and let people know, I have been aware of Heather's work since the 1990s. She wrote a wonderful um, uh, paper in Holyoke, a, a report uh, related to teen pregnancy, and now she's moved on to um, tobacco-free. So she has been committed to working with youth since the 90s, and her work is amazing. So um, welcome, Heather. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so Heather Warner, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I reside at 115 Pine Street in Florence. Um, however, I also am a, um, I grew up in Amherst. So um, that's, that's my hometown. Um, and my family still lives in Amherst. So I'm very invested in the community. Uh, I am here today to um, talk a little bit about the, uh, the nicotine uh, tobacco-free regulations in Amherst. And I know that there's, um, that you have, that Amherst has been a leader in having strong uh, tobacco-free regulations. And, you know, this was important back in the 90s, like you said, it was, you know, these types of local regulations are really what led the charge in, you know, creating state laws that increased the age of use and, and sales and um, banned flavored tobacco. And now, 
um, you know, you have regulations which are intended to reduce the outlet density of tobacco retailers by retiring licenses that don't get reapplied for. Um, so I'm speaking out today because I know that there's um, that one of the licenses for University Drive was um, retired, and I know there's an effort to um, have that reinstated. And um, I guess I'm uh, just going to talk a little bit about why I feel like the regulation is important and you know, that the intent behind it is really to um, continue to reduce the number of uh, retailers. Um, let's see, the, I feel like policy, like I said, is one of the most important ways that we can um, reduce the harms from tobacco use. And we've seen it over and over again in our, the history in Massachusetts and locally. Um, there's also, um, you know what one a couple of things that we know about um oops, I got my hand, about outlet density and the number of tobacco licenses is that um when there when there are more tobacco retailers youth are more likely to experiment with smoking um people who already smoke will consume more cigarettes per day when they are um you know surrounded by more nicotine outlets and tobacco use rates are affected by where tobacco retailers are located and where they're concentrated. So um, oftentimes they're concentrated in areas where there's low income housing or um, people of color or young people. And including when we think of University Drive, we can think of UMass. Um, so there's equity issues too related to, you know, the number of retailers and where they're located. Um, I guess the only thing I also want to say, because I was looking at some of the notes and hearing about and looking in the paper and stuff about some of the um, comments from the last Board of Health meeting, and I know that there was some discussion about, uh, you know, age, you know, about um, whether or not a re an alcohol retailer was an adult only or 21 plus establishment. And I ended up calling um, Ralph Sacamone from the Alcohol Beverage Control Commission. And he let me know and pointed me to the website to indicate that there are no such license designations for alcohol, um, that anybody of any age can enter an alcohol establishment. And sometimes there might be a house rule not to let somebody in who's under 21, but that's not a licensed type of license. And so um, I know that, you know, there's, there's a lot of money involved in tobacco sales. And so there's um, a big effort to try to find get arounds in a local regulation or loopholes. And, you know, I just would refer back to the intention behind these regulations, which is really to limit access to young people and to reduce the harms of tobacco and the way the Board of Health is helping our community in Amherst to do that is by retiring licenses once they expire. So I really commend you in that effort and support you in that effort and um, um, hope that you know, you're able to um, address the issue. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. Okay, uh, Darcy Dumont has her hand raised. Um, do you oh, um, I was gonna. Oh, oh, oh wait a minute. Oh, oh, this is Lisa. Okay, okay, Lisa. <laughs> so, okay, you were let in already. Okay, so Apologies. Lisa Stevens. Good night. Okay, sorry. Um, thank you, thank you, Madam Jerome. Uh, so, my name is Lisa Stevens. Good night. I am the Tobacco Control Director with the Massachusetts Municipal Association. Um, for those of you who uh, helped draft the regulations that are at discussion. Um, I took over for DJ who retired uh, almost a, about a year ago, um, oh. coming up on his one year anniversary of retirement. So, <laughs> and I work with Cheryl Sabara um, through the MTCP, the Massachusetts T uh, Tobacco Control Program to provide technical assistance to cities and towns um, in, in enforcing and drafting and acting regulations around tobacco control. Um, so I wanted to thank you guys all for um, the work that you're doing. And I know that there were some questions that were raised at the last meeting, and I just wanted to address some of the questions that I heard after, well, when watching 
the video um, as as um, Heather said, one of the biggest things that there seemed to be some confusion around is whether or not uh, liquor stores were age restricted. And as Heather mentioned, they, they're not age restricted under the law, which would be the important thing. So an establishment can choose to ID at the door, but they aren't required to do so. And that's what the meaning of that non-age restricted means in the um, regulations. And part of that is because uh, there is the exposure to products is one of the things you're trying to reduce. Uh, so a five-year-old can't buy stuff in an adult-only retail store, but we don't even really want them seeing the products in an adult-only retail store because that exposure can increase their chances of trying tobacco down the road. So you can't bring like your kid in with you to an adult-only tobacco store, um, but you can bring your kid into a liquor store with you to pick up something. So that's kind of the difference there is that the IDing happens at the door, not just for the product that's for sale. And the other thing I wanted to say is that the situation it seems like in this particular instance is is unique in the sense that of the way the transfer of the property happened um so that would be where you guys would make that decision um so because again because of the way that the transfer happened as opposed to where it's normally just a business to business transfer um and i'm happy to um, leave my information or provide my information if you guys have any questions down the road uh about those decisions or um Kind of what is required under state law or what you can do locally thank you thank you very much and um darcy had her hand up hi can you hear me mm -hmm. yes uh, hi, I won't take much of your time. Um, good evening. My name is Darcy Dumont and I live in District 3. Uh, thank you for taking my public comment on behalf of Zero Waste Amherst. Uh, I'm just here to give a uh, the board a little bit more of an update than what is in the CWA letter to the board that was uh, sent for today's meeting. First, um, I think you received an update on the survey ZWA was requested to conduct regarding Amherst's current hauler services with USA Waste and Recycling. They're the only company licensed to collect residential waste in Amherst, so people either need to use uh, the transfer station or USA. USA states it has approximately 3,200 residential customers in Amherst. So in the survey, we found that USA is not attempting to reduce trash um, at all via any pay-as-you-throw system. It charges people who get trash pickup every two weeks the same as those who get pickup every week. It charges only $2 difference between trash cart sizes per month, providing virtually no incentive to reduce trash. We confirm both our trash reduction and prices. Sorry, somehow my computer just stopped. Stop now. I'm back on my on my iPad. I'm sorry, I lost complete connection um, for for a minute. Is it okay to continue? Yeah. Oh yes, but Great. I, I disappeared. I think. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, we confirm both our trash reduction and pricing data with USA. The main reason the survey was conducted was that USA prices have not been transparent to the public. We found that the average price is approximately $550 a year, including um, the cost to 200 residents who, because they, for some reason, can't get their cart to the curb, have to pay over $1,000 a year. Uh, we have a long list of supporting organizations from around town and now a list of over 80 folks who volunteered to help to do, do outreach for the program if and when it launches. We fervently hope the town council will adopt the proposed bylaw uh, that we first brought to the Board of Health in October of 2021 and which is now in the town services and outreach committee so that the Board of Health can then promulgate uh, amended regulations, and we can get a request for proposals out this fall and start the program in January 2024. It would be hugely beneficial to the public health, the climate, and to residents' pocketbooks to start reducing our waste in January rather than waiting yet another year. Thanks so much uh, for your consideration. Thank you, Darcy. 
Okay, are there any other hands up? Um, Kyle, do you see any other hands up? I do not. Okay, neither do I. Okay. So thank you everybody for your comment. Oh, I have no idea what's going on. Oh. We can still uh, see. Yeah, you're still here. here. <laughs> okay. I'm having more problems today. Okay. Sorry, everybody. So we're going on to old business with toxic chemical regulations with Tim. And Tim and I did a Zoom with um, T. Oh, wait. You can talk about it, Tim. Mm -hmm. Tim, are you there? Mm -hmm. He's muted. Okay, you got it. There, okay. Uh, so um, our conversation started with Turi. Um, Dr. Uh, Bekut was the person who was actually uh, engaging, but he was busy. Um, recently and and he directed us to um uh to some resources in the executive office of environmental affairs which is the primarily the state government um that is the office of technical assistance <clears throat> so um i arranged a meeting with uh, carrie sespotas uh who is the director of that uh, office and also tiffany uh, skolstrom um, um also has some background in uh, health public health so we had a very detailed discussion nancy joined uh, joined, uh, joined the conversation um they expressed what uh, some sort of a um uh, uh, the, you know the appreciation for what we are discussing but also um they conveyed on what they can discuss and what they cannot discuss because they are a state government but our discussion actually uh, went through the history of this um, uh, this uh, particular uh, regulation we had, um, and um, and and what we are looking for in terms of uh, all the new contaminants which uh, which have come in into the into play in the new regulations, um, and also we discussed about what is the specifics. Um, um, uh, a specific type of a uh, focus area we are going to have. And I think that's where the procurement side of things came up. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so we had some um, excellent discussion about, you know, what are some of the different options and, and, and they directed uh, to uh, someone, Julia Wolf, um, yes. who is the director of environmental purchasing. Um, uh, so Julia sent uh, a, a nice list of uh, resources for environmentally preferred purchasing as well as products and services and some of the EPP policies. Uh, they have some website on that. Um, and then there's also Ann Arbor, Michigan has some uh, as an ecology center, which has developed purchasing for safer cities, uh, which is some sort of a document uh, that could be used. Um, Julia uh, also is open to talk further about uh, uh, with me or anyone else uh, from the board. You, you can, so um, I haven't actually uh, arranged that meeting. So that is the next step. We'll be actually having that uh, meeting with uh, Julia uh, and see what type of resources um, we could access to and in, in terms of fine tuning our regulation. Thank Nancy, you, you think, yeah. Tim. Uh, I found it very interesting um, and they would come up to to a certain point and then they'd say, well, we can't advise because of this government. Um, they also mentioned that some towns are 
are looking at a bylaw related to PFAS, if I remember correctly. And I thought um, the environmental purchasing would be very helpful probably to Jeremiah uh, LaPlante. Um, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, and um, I had some um, uh, internet, it, it, it went pretty well, but I was picking up my grandson. Um, so I was in the car doing the meeting in the car um, on my iPhone. And um, I, I found it very helpful. Tim, what do you, do, do other people have any questions for Tim or I? I, I just wonder if you see a way to put this into sort of the structure of a regulation or guideline or whatever, you know, it seems a little bit of a difficult task to me. It is. <laughs> Tim, I'm going to lean on you. So that's an excellent question. That's what we had been thinking about. Where do we go from here? Um, we saw from uh, Jeremy, you know, in terms of what the procurement policies are, they look like they're already doing uh, purchasing of very green products and uh, uh, environmentally preferred products. Um, so, so one way is this information, which I'm collecting from uh, from the uh, procurement office, might help with Jeremy. But uh, I think the problem is much broader than procurement in my opinion <laughs> um, I, I, and but the problem has multiple uh, I would say levels of governance you know you have the national state and then finally it comes down to a community and so some of these contaminants had been in the forefront of EPA uh, EPA has been developing some standards um, for a few of those uh, uh, PFAS uh, so, in that sense, um, regulation should go beyond uh, procurement. It should it should go to you know in terms of usage you know, everywhere. But that is probably is going to be much more complex in in for a board of health to actually develop. But one thing I'm thinking of is uh, it might be better to develop this as guidelines so that uh, it can be used for more outreach, education of the public, rather than developing like a, as a regulation. I don't know, that's my opinion. I like that, that approach, um, Tim, because when we go back to the history of this regulation from 2000, 2001, it was really for purchasing um, and, uh, so I, I think a guideline, because no one's enforced this regulation, there's no way to enforce it. So a guideline and then uh, to keep looking at PFAS and um, toxic chemicals more, um, I think that would be more a, um, um, uh, on the, um, a bylaw rather than a board of health regulation. Because towns in Connecticut have done that related to PFAS and artificial turf, they've gone to bylaws. Hmm. What are other people's thoughts? Can, can the board of health make a bylaw or no? Just no, that, that's the town council. Okay, I think I'm on information overload with, <laughs> with all the town meetings and all the other yeah. things. But I, I so bylaws, town council, board of health is regulation. Okay, I just, I wanted to give my, my thoughts um, because of the meeting that I did miss talking about um, the um, tattooing 
uh, regulations. And I think that when it comes to the Board of Health, just my, my thought is, is whether it's guidelines or it's a regulation, we want to not feel, not, not make the public feel like we're um, trying to control their behavior, but wanting to protect the health of the public. So I would just suggest that any regulations or guidelines that we have um, are stated in a way that are clear and are, um, for example, um, not just saying, um, I, I know I'm getting off a little topic about the tattoos, but not just saying what can be done, but also what what should not be done because if there is a public health issue the board of health or the um department of health should be there for people to feel like they can you know come, come to you know for advice or help or assistance and so i just i just think that is something that we should keep in mind you know when writing regulations and not be afraid to state um that there are some that should should not be done. Thank you, Lauren. Pramila, do you have any comments on this? Where how we should well, I proceed was wondering, on the chemicals? I mean, is there a pressing concern right now? Are we aware of of any any town office that's using uh not environmentally friendly materials or no I, uh, I, because you're relatively new on the board what happened two years ago i just went through all of our um regulations and i asked um different board members to review in pairs to review our oldest regulations to see if we needed to review uh, revise them or update them or change them and um and toxic chemicals came up then um, when i went back to the history of it it was brought up to the board of first to the town it was the, the select board to have a bylaw on purchasing environmentally friendly cleaning and paper and whatnot products and the town um, select board gave it to the board of health and the board of health developed this mainly it was a purchasing toxic for toxic chemicals and now we've been working on this for two years and try and and then pfas came up and artificial turf came up so we've been um trying to figure out what to do with this existing regulation does that clarify things for you premola um yes uh, but the regulations right now specify what can, I mean, I'm, I'm just wondering about the nature of the regulations. I'm sure I've looked at them at some point because you did have. Yes, and I, I don't have them in front of me and I don't dare go to a split screen on my computer because I, I was losing connection. So I, yeah. Tim, can oh, you address fine. that? Tim, you're muted. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, um, the the regulations currently, I think we have a um, typically on how we uh, draft the regulations in in terms of defining different things. But the final outcome is um, it comes to um, not a very clear. Um, uh, regulation in terms of what they can or cannot do, but it's just actually saying it's a precautionary pr principle type of an approach of mm -hmm. don't, you know, if you're facing a use of this one, try to find the minimally toxic one or something like that, because we couldn't provide some sort of a clear um, yes or no type of a thing which can develop a regulation. So that's where I think it went um, the, the whole regulation is private. Regulation needs to have something 
some sort of a contrast in terms of what we can do and we cannot do, like a standard. <laughs> uh, and 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 so I think that's what I think we we ended up actually saying. Okay, we should talk to the um, procurement office, the fire department, and everything. And and that's where the discussions are emerging into state. And so I don't know if I answered your question. So. Yeah, I, I wonder, was there some part of the discussion um, that centered around whether these things were enforceable or not? If I recall, there was some discussion about that. Yes, I, I think um, after writing, it went back to, um, uh, I went back to in terms of actually engaging stakeholders, uh, and that's where the enforcement came into who who is going to actually enforce. This type of discussion came up, but what is the enforcement mechanism? Um, uh, there's a lot of ambiguity on, you know, lack of clarity in that, and uh, so that's where we were trying to find some sort of a um, language or anything at the state level or with theory, but. It looks like I think we probably are uh, the first one we're trying to develop that. Is there a particular concern right now? I mean, other than you were reviewing the old regulations, does PFAS come into this somehow? Or how no. they have... The way the regulation is written, PFAS doesn't, I, I, it's my understanding, PFAS does not come under this regulation. Am I, cor is that correct, Tim, with your understanding of the existing regulation? So, yeah, the existing regulation is essentially for dealing with some procurement of paper, I think, unbleached paper and <laughs> yes. fluorine, fluorine free paper or something like that. That's how it was there written. And, and, and when we look at the concept of toxic, that's when I think the board, I mean, we had been dis discussing on what type of, what are the toxic chemicals actually. And mm -hmm. these are emerging contaminants which are directly influential in public health. And so in the regulations, when we were at some sort of a revising, we looked at a lot of literature, more recent one. And then that's where PFAS came in. Um, other um, uh, nicotinoids, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, other types of uh, potential contaminants, I think, which are which are probably uh, um, pesticides. Uh, all those things came into you know into be added into the regulation. But then we started to realize, you know, in terms of what is the diff guidelines in terms of how how we regulate these multiple contaminants. Mm -hmm. um, uh, beyond what the federal government is doing or the state government is doing. The DEA. And the, continue to, to I'm sorry, I forgot you No, e even PFAS is uh, is off. It's not a, mm -hmm. you know, PFAS itself was something new, for, even for the federal government. And the EPA is, has been developing standards there. And uh, so I think uh, wait and see in terms of regulations, um, in, in terms of the federal government and the state government, definitely they'll, they'll be having standards developed. And those which are not covered in those two, I think probably the town can take on in that level. But, but it's a very the, complex one, yeah. Mm -hmm. in, in the past, I'd say maybe five or six years ago, there was an issue brought up about the use of Roundup. Mm -hmm. And we talked to buildings and grounds and school and maintenance. And we found out that Roundup was very, very infrequently used. And it was only used on a patch of poison ivy at, I think, Mill River or Groff Park, because hand pulling um, did not eradicate the poison ivy. And they were afraid children would get it. And it was just used once. Uh, just to remove this poison ivy to avoid children getting it. And I, so the town was not using um, Roundup at all, um, except in a very limited 
use. And that was maybe five or six years ago, we, we asked about that because it, it came up. Um, so I like the idea of a, a guideline on um, procurement, um, environmental purchasing versus a regulation. I don't know what other people think. And, and the other part of that might be not just what the town is purchasing, but maybe educational things for the population of, you know, Amherst and, you know, just make awareness about you, you don't need to use the most toxic thing to get your the job done most of the time, you know, you can give up, you can use uh, things that are safer for the for people and for the environment. Because it just does seem to be impossible to regulate it in a, at our level and the vagaries of PFASs and PFOS. I mean, there are like thousands of them and even the federal government was only gonna put limits on six and you know, whether you've, you substitute a different one, it's not gonna be any better. You know, it's, it's like, mm -hmm. it sounds like whack-a-mole. Um, yes. Um, you know, it, it's, I think it's beyond our scope <laughs> a little bit to do that. Um, and that was what I was leaning to because it, if we can't enforce a regulation, it, it, then it, it's beyond the, the scope of what we, we and the health department can do. Um, and when you look at that original one, it was buying chlorine free paper products. Which is a good thing. <laughs> um, and they're better paper products that are, you know, be more recycled or as opposed to yes. cutting down the trees and right. Um, so it was the idea that we would come up with with a list of recommendations for various categories of things and then maybe post them on the board website or Tim, where would you like to go with that, with a guideline? So guidelines, um, I, think, uh, I, I think Maureen was right in saying that the guidelines should not only focus on procurement, but it, it, education is the key. That means it, this has to be a grassroots level uh, awareness and uh, adoption of some sort of a greener practices. So said that one, uh, if we provide a guidelines, I think we could always um, uh, make, make some sort of a list of things people can, um, I think we already have defined those lists, but I think uh, we can match it with some resources on mm -hmm. where people can actually go and get uh, alternate products. Or, um, so these guidelines can also be a like a fact sheet or something which could also be used for educational purposes. Mm -hmm. Is that how the board would like to proceed with this? Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. Um, I think we really struggled with, you know, when Jennifer asked, well, what do I do with this, you know, and how do we, uh, in, force it or if, if some if the if someone needs something that might be the little less toxic than something else how does she approve it and evaluate that it just seemed very uh, mushy and hard to hard to do um would would anyone like to make a motion that we move to developing guidelines in education for um, using less toxic products. Uh, how would you like to word that, Tim? Because you've been working on this for two years now. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll make a motion to um, revise the existing toxic chemical uh, 
regulation to develop as a guideline for recommendation for alternate use of the chemicals, alternate uh, uh, less toxic chemicals. I don't know so if that. Would someone like to second that? I can second that. Any further discussion? Okay, so we'll move to voting. Um, Maureen. Aye. Tim. Aye. Premila. Premila, are you muted? Sorry. Aye, I was muted, sorry. Aye. <laughs> okay. Lauren. I think we lost Lauren. Is she, yeah, I don't see her anymore. She said she was having trouble charging her phone. Yeah. Okay. So we lost Lauren and Nancy I. And Lauren is absent for this vote. Okay, so thank you. Moving on. Move on with that. Moving on to body arts establishment regulation. Maureen, you've been doing a yeoman's job on that. I guess I wonder, do we want to start going through this bit by bit? I mean, this is it's a, it's a lot. I don't know yeah. if people have had a chance to read it or if they have thoughts about it or the direction that we might go on this. So have people had a chance to look at this, at the, the revised with all of um, the edits and pieces in it? I've looked at it quickly. The one area that I had wanted to discuss was that um, the guest artist temporary permit was a 14 day permit and it can be um, have four permits per calendar year. That's and what Northampton does. Uh, yeah, and I just thought, well, 14 days at $25 starts getting expensive. Would we wanna do a, a, a 30 day versus a, a 14 day? Yeah, I think um, when we talked with Stephen and when we spoke we talked the last time, I think we did say maybe we would do like, I don't know if 28 days or 30 days is the right number of days, but that can be maybe three of those through the year or something. Yeah, and I, and I thought 30 days because that's a month. Um, okay. 30, 31 days. And I think I'm trying to think about this a little bit because, you know, you know, I, I, you know, you just think, well, that's like 90 days in a year, but you want, you, you don't want like people to do it for two days here and three days there. Cause that, that would just be a, an, an administrative nightmare. And, um, but I think the, the thought was, you know, it seems like the purpose, one of the purposes at least is for someone to see if they're a good match for, mm -hmm. for one, for the business, um, or maybe if it's just someone who's uh, well known, or you know, uh, uh, that that would be able to come and work in a, in the in the town uh, for a period of time. So I was thinking of saying up to thirty days and up up to three per year per person. Yeah, I like I liked that better. Okay. Oh. Um. And they, um, I mean, there are a lot of small questions, but a big question is, I think it's on page nine, it's under the restrictions. And, um, and I don't know if you want to, because our regulations had been quite restrictive in terms of piercing, basically saying you could only pierce what? the eyebrow, ear, nipple, and nose, navel, lip, and tongue, um, and all, everything else wasn't allowed. Um, so, uh, you know, that's simple, because then you, because do, you don't have to think of all the other things <laughs> that you don't want to allow. 
but there was the list that I put in there. It's actually from Lowell. It's really the same thing that Northampton has in terms of the things that are not allowed. Um, but it's it was much easier to read in a in a list type of uh, organization. Um, and I think those, you know, I did a bunch of reading about different kinds of piercings, and I think that really covers a lot of the things that I saw that were not not thought to be a good idea, even by piercers. There's like I saw mm -hmm. in blogs and saying, "Here are the piercings I would never do, and I don't think mm -hmm. anybody should do." Um, you know, that was a personal thought, but but it kind of ca encapsulated some of these same uh procedures the other thing it does do it, it actually opens up things like branding and scarification which we hadn't allowed before that's allowed i think in northampton and in boston and some other places i don't know how popular those things are um but it does seem like those were things that were described in a lot of other places. Mm -hmm. um, and that's only on adult adults. I mean, we're still more limiting with people, with minors under 18, and even more so with, uh, with people under the age of 14. And again, none of those age restrictions apply to just piercing of the ear lobes. So, mm -hmm. um, for that. And the whole idea of, of um, adding an apprentice program, I think, as Ed had mentioned last time, or at one point when we talked about this they did approve an apprenticeship uh, in town. I guess maybe it was under the variances or um, mm -hmm. whatever, um, but this kind of uh, makes it more official and has very specific uh, requirements, both for the pre-apprenticeship program and the actual training. Um, you know, the curriculum, so to speak. Um, and that that kind of bounces back onto what the requirements of training are when when you're make, allowing a license for a body art practitioner because it it raises the that the amount of experience to be equivalent to what the apprenticeship was. I, I think it, for piercing, it had been like two years, and and the, with the apprenticeship, those are three three years. Um, some of that involves just practicing under a, a trainer. It, you know, they're working and getting paid, but they're still under the guidance guidance of a, a trainer. So are you comfortable with everything? What are you, what would you like input from us? I've, I've read it. What would you like input from us on? Well, what do you think about the restrictions? Um, and the, what do you think about, about what we are allowing and what we are disallowing? I guess that's a big I, piece of this. Um, from a health point of view, the restrictions make sense um, um, to me. Mm -hmm. I guess, yeah, what we are allowing now is genital piercing, which we did not before. Um, and not. I don't think many other things, but um, I 
And then I there are a lot of to- very small things. Like I actually reached out to Ed about, you know, some of the things about <laughs> the toilets, you know, yeah. <laughs> like if, you know, I think one of these regulations from Northampton was such that, you know, actually a tattoo uh, or piercing body art establishment has to have a toilet for for private and for client use. But if they're in like a mall type situation and there is another toilet that's available, they don't have to have a toilet, you know. So, <laughs> um, you know, they're sort of really everything from nuts and bolts to and the autoclave um, issue, you know, yeah. like the regulations about the autoclave, which I also reached out to Ed about. I thought he might know more about that than I do. Mm-hmm. And um, and if you use all disposable, then you don't need just don't, you just don't need it. Which I think we need to leave it in that it's there. But I, I think the, the the trend, and maybe it's exclusive now that that people use totally disposable things. Um, Yeah, I know know when I read the toilet on page 12 with toilet paper and (laughs) stuff. No, it's it's like building code type things and the temperature of the water and a (laughs) certain kind of valve and the plumbing. And, you know, it's... it's, um... The other question was whether high school diploma I think we decided to let yes. go of that yes um and again Northampton and a lot of places specify the cost of the permit or yeah, permit and licenses um we didn't it was always at a reasonable I don't know there's a statement in there that it's at a reasonable fee I guess we have a fee structure that's separate from this so I need to change some text there the other thing is like the renewal policy and I think we've done this with some other things instead of it's being renewed one year from the date it was issued that it could be renewed at the end of the calendar year year. so that they so So it's it's less confusing it's insightful yeah Yeah, and that was from Northampton um huh you know and one basic thing about you know sometimes the whether you're referring to the license for the body art practitioner or a permit and my thought was and tell me if other people uh think that's okay is like I think a license applies to a person and you know that they have this permission via a license to do their craft or art or procedures um and the permit is for the establishment because it yes. just needs to wander the back permits and forth. for the establishment and the problem is the state does not have a licensing procedure for body tattooist right right um, because it's it's they just started allowing it in the past yeah. right whatever so, so they don't and if it that. yes but manicurists need a license i know from the state <laughs> from the state <laughs> and you know the, i think the re- oh, trying to think you know there's, you can really there's one part of this maybe you could read it now and, and it's hard to take things out of context because um you don't know what's in the rest of the body if you just do this but um on the bottom of page 15 section d this i think is from 2008 and it just seems weird to me in some ways especially the part three i don't have i don't on page 15 i don't have d i just have numbers we should I, I maybe you have an old version. No, this is the one that you just sent out. I thought I know. Well, communicable and bloodborne diseases. Oh, I must have the. That's okay. actually page sixteen. Oh, okay. Because I have okay. Because this is May fourth. Yes. Yeah, 
May six. Wow. Okay, it's page sixteen. Oh, maybe something happened because <laughs> I when I. Okay, I, there it is. It's page 16D, yes. Okay. Yes. Just, especially three. Those standards mentioned at the last they do not exist anymore. Yeah. And I can't imagine that it isn't just universal precautions. Mm -hmm. And I think, is that in blue? I, I'm looking at a printed copy. It is in blue, yeah. And so that's from Northampton. We did not have that and in our, uh, in our regulations. So my thought was to not put that in. Yeah. I have to keep it, the main, was updating it and also having guest artists and then the apprentice. Mm -hmm. um, but as you know, it gets, <laughs> get into the weeds. Um, and I think it we added some additional things about documentation of you know, uh, in, oh, about record keeping and getting a more, somewhat more records like a photo ID versus just, yes. uh, yeah. and also keeping it longer, like for five years instead of three years. And um, the other question I thought I, out. I mean, I, I think it says it requires blood brown pathogen training, um, but it doesn't say how often. Um, and I know for healthcare providers that that set settings, it's usually an annual event, blood borne pathogen. Mm -hmm. uh, and I and CPR and first aid are annual for in our regulations, but I wonder if putting that as an annual, um, you know, it's usually kind of an online thing or uh, I don't know. Uh, there's there are options from both uh, the Red Cross or other. I can't remember who else, or also from professional organizations, like there's a safe piercing, I've forgotten the A, there's a piercing and there's a tattooing professional organizations that have those kinds of uh, supports for practitioners and businesses. Um, I guess I would like one, at least one other person to kind of go through it line by line and just say, what, <laughs> you know, just to make sure that it, it, it seems to fit together and that I didn't um, miss something. I think that section D, yeah, could use some work. I mean, I'm not even sure what the point of number two is. No, I know. So I guess you're not supposed to be diagnosing somebody's. Yeah. Now, where did that come condition? from? Northampton. Yeah, Northampton. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so that why? whole section might yeah. just go. It's just weird. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, are we even? It does do the regulations. As I recall, we don't specify. Um, testing requirements for practitioners, right? So no, um, yeah, it doesn't make sense. No. And what would you do? You wouldn't. I mean, you would just 
do universal precautions at right. the same way. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, right. So universal precautions and the awareness of, 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 of CPR and what to do is important in case there's a ink or some kind of reaction. Um, but yeah, you're not going to diagnose. I mean, that's not. Uh, yeah, that doesn't make sense. I, you no. know, uh, Maureen, I'm happy to to go yeah. through. I mean, my time is about to open up a little bit, so oh, that's good. I, yeah, so I can I can do that, and I'm sorry that I haven't had a chance to really read I, it all now. I know that has yeah. been not, not as easy time right now, but I guess yeah. with the the end of the school year, uh, yeah. things things. Yeah, but you got to get through reunions too, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, maybe when you, if you can have a chance to go through it, at some yeah. point, maybe you can be in touch with me and we can yeah. kind of do it. Why don't together. we put it on the, the July um, agenda? Right. And maybe we'll have something to vote on by then. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would like that. Okay. Oh, so yeah. Oh, that. Yeah, June. Do you think June's too soon? Well, June, um, the students are presenting their community assessment. Okay. Data, so that's going to okay. take okay. A, a large right. amount of time. Okay, it it so. would be nice to have a little more time. Leeway, yes. right. Yeah, because I don't. So Premola will review it and it will be on the July agenda, hopefully for voting on yeah if we have enough members <laughs> um okay i have a quick question sure. yes. uh, uh, did any of the regulations have uh, any mention of carrying insurance by these establishments well one of the one the only regulation I saw was that part of the signage was to say that whether the establishment has malpractice insurance or not. So to let people know whether they do or not. I I I don't know how how you know I don't know how many in, practitioners or establishments do have malpractice insurance. I didn't see anything about that. Um, I'm sure businesses are insured, like, you know, if somebody were to trip and fall, right? Or for theft or fire or whatever. Um, but as far as practicing, um, there is such a thing as malpractice insurance for the practitioners, but I don't know how how common it is. But I think it was the idea was, I think that's from Northampton. Oh, gosh, I can't remember now, but it was to have a signage whether or not they had like a posting, whether they had insurance or not. I mean, this is for malpractice, right? Yeah. I mean, someone yeah, wrongfully someone... sues, right? For the doctor or whatever it is. But right. My. I mean, if there is any mishap, that's what I'm saying. If there was some sort of a, um, um, any type of, because here we are dealing with um, the body itself, you know, so I'm just curious, there are, there are apprentices, if there is some sort of a infection Mm -hmm. by a communicable disease, whatever it is, you know. But, uh, no, I think probably there's not there's no insurance. insurance for that. I mean, it, it, malpractice would be one thing, Only but one. possibility. But an occurrence or complication, I think the, the thing is disclosure that these things can happen. And um, part, a lot of it, a lot of uh, prevention is described in the procedures of what, how you approach uh doing things cleanly and professionally and all but aftercare is a big thing for for the outcome mm -hmm. and uh training on aftercare is pretty much emphasized in every part of the of the regulation and how the importance of that um 
and and there is a disclosure disclosure requirement yeah. in order yeah you have to That's, sign yeah. an agreement so you have there to, we can enter you that. Have okay. to, there's information that has to be given before and there's a consent to to the procedure um yeah but um any okay. other questions for Maureen? Okay, we'll be on the July agenda. Thank you, Maureen and well, Premila. Okay, next is the tobacco license for Six University Drive. It was brought up um, at our last meeting and we looked at our regulations which clearly state that any permit not renewed either because a retailer no longer sells tobacco products because a retailer closes a retail business, it shall be returned to the Amherst Board of Health and shall be permanently re retired. And that applicants who purchase or acquire an existing business that holds a valid tobacco product sales permit at the time of sale or acquisition of said business must apply within 60 days. And the license, so the permit for Six University Drive had been retired. Um, and the issue is keeping it retired versus not keeping it retired. And we have the information. Um, I had uh, Jennifer and Kyle sent out the um, existing permits. And then um, uh, attorney Evans sent an email and I contacted Cheryl Sabara, who then sent a letter to attorney Evans, which you had. And then we had Lisa Stevens, good night, also comment today on um, our regulations and um, the permit. So the issue is, um, giving a permit or keeping it completely um, retired as it has been. Does anyone have any questions? Could you go over the timeline of things that I kind of got, I like when the business closed and that was retired and when the purchase happened and... I, I would, Jennifer did not give me that. The, the business closed I want to say two years ago. Oh, okay. Or eight, 18 months to two years okay. ago. All right, your pandemic. Uh -huh. um, so the when was, and that's when the permit was retired? Yes, it was not renewed. And then the, the um, um, business was purchased. I, I do not have the, it, it, Jennifer did not give me the date. Yeah, I might be part, um, like December or something like that. Correct. Um, I noted that our our total number of our cap on per, on uh, tobacco licenses and stuff was eighteen, and we're down to fourteen. There are only right. fourteen listed. And uh, what should be happening is every time one is retired, that number should come down. And I, I don't think the uh, Record keeping has copied that mm -hmm. because that was from 2020. Um, and every time a, a um, permit retires, 
it, that number should be coming down. And I do remember the last time the, the lawyer was advocating for the idea that because this is an adult only. But it, uh, it is it not. Had, we hadn't only. regulated this particular kind of business, but in fact, our our regulations as we permit smoke uh, sale of, of tobacco and nicotine products here in these adult only stores, which have a specific definition, and here in these uh, non-adult only. And, and so there is no way to say there are places where we would allow it that it don't fit into those categories. I mean, we permitted these two settings and, and that that's that's how it's right. And, and adult only means no one under 21 can enter. Right. There's someone at the door that and you can't sell anything you. else. And you can't right. sell anything else. So right. um it doesn't fit the definition. No. And you heard from um, Heather today and uh, Lisa Stevens, good night, that there is a reason for retiring and uh, keeping these licenses retired to decrease the access of tobacco to younger people and um, uh, according to research, um, uh, the brain isn't fully developed until 25, 26. So exposure to tobacco use, even in the early 20s, um, means a usually a long, a long term addiction to nicotine versus if you start uh, the older you start, the greater the chances that you can stop um, stop smoking. The younger you start, the greater the chance that you will not ever stop smoking or using a nicotine product, I should say. So is there a timeline for a ruling, a ruling on this or? No, we, we can, it, the, it is, we've been asked if we would allow this permit to go through even though it has been retired. And my feeling is that it's been retired and there's a reason for retirement of our regulations. And that unfortunately is it. Mm -hmm. I, um, so what I need is, uh, 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 if anyone has any other comments, my, my belief is that the permit is gone. It has been retired. And once it's retired, we don't let them yeah, we be re renewed. Be resurrected, yes. Yes. I mean, our regulation is clear. Cheryl Sabara said our regulation is clear. If we were to grant this permit, we would have to give a variance or change our regulation according mm -hmm. to Cheryl Sabara. And so do we vote on it or just? We vote on it. So we, so we need a motion saying. So we need a motion. I'll Maybe. make, do you have uh, a question, have, Tim? We have, uh, it's Kyle, we have Dick Evans, the attorney raised his hand. I'm not sure if we're allowing comments at this time. I just wanted to make you aware. Um, the comment period was at the beginning. Or at the end. Uh, well, no, we've eliminated. It's just at the beginning. Oh, okay. Would the board like to hear from the lawyer? Oh, Stephen Lambert had his hand up. Um, 
I, I, would the board like to hear from the lawyer, Dick Evans, for the owner? At this point, I didn't think that was our practice. Is to... It is, it's not our practice. Okay, so it's not our practice. Public comment is over. So, and we're not having a hearing, we're just voting on this permit. So I would like a motion on the permit. Would you like me to make the motion? Yeah, I was having trouble coming up with the right wording. wording. Yeah. Yes. because it says that any permit not renewed shall be returned to the Board of Health and shall be permanently retired. Mm -hmm. So it would be that the permit for six University Drive was not renewed and has been returned to the Board of Health and it is permanently retired. How would we say that to follow the regulations and to yes. and not to restore the permit yeah. that was retired mm -hmm. by the previous owner? To adhere to the uh, I'd have to get my. Can I try? Um, yes. I I make a motion that the permit uh, for six university drive, uh, which was not renewed and returned, uh, not be renewed under the existing policy. Uh, I'd say under the existing regulations. Regulations. Mm -hmm. I'll second that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded to permanently retire and not renew the uh, tobacco sales permit or the nicotine sales permit for um, six university drives. Let me get the, the exact. Um, Amherst Board of Health are um, Amherst, let me get the exact title of our regulation. Board of Health regulations. It the regulation is restricting youth access and exposure to tobacco and nicotine delivery products. So that's our regulation. So we'll put yeah. that in there. Okay, so we have a motion. It's been seconded. Um, Maureen. Oh, we're, we're voting, voting now. No, we're voting okay. now. Uh, oh, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? No. Okay. Okay, so now we're voting. Maureen? Aye. Tim? Aye. Premila? Aye. <laughs> Lauren? Lauren, are you there? Lauren says yes in the chat. 
Okay, Warren says yes, and Nancy, yes. Okay, so it's unanimous that that permit is retired. Thank you. Okay, zero waste. Um, Amherst, we heard from Darcy and you have the, received the letter that she would, and Zero Waste Amherst would like the board to um, urge the town council to adopt the waste hauler proposal um, as presented by Zero Waste so that it can be implemented on January, uh, in January, 2024. Is any discussion on this? Um, uh, this is the process. So this uh, this vote would be to encourage the the, the town council the town to council to adopt the waste hauler proposal that was proposed by zero waste Amherst. So what it would be is that um, the Board of Health will urge the town council to adopt the waste hauler proposal this summer so that it can be implemented by January, 2024. That's what and, we're being asked. And the town council can make changes in that proposal. I mean, there's proposals about the yes. about the pricing structure, the things that I didn't quite understand, honestly. Um, yes. That, um, you know, there, there are a lot of details that seem like there needs, you know, that might bear some discussion or understanding, better understanding. This is just asking the town council to act on to move the it along. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Yeah. To move it along. Yeah. Which makes sense to me if it's been uh two in years process since 2021. Yeah. I mean okay. yes. So it's a uh, the delay is because of a lot of information is missing on economics. Mm -hmm. And so developing those some sort of economic data and everything was the one which was um, delaying it. And, and I'm still not clear on what the board is recommending. Is, is the board recommending to hasten this process or if town council is already um, using all the data and evidence to move forward or are we? We're being uh, asked just to urge the town council to move on this mm -hmm. so that it can be implemented by January 2024 instead of it sitting for another year. Mm -hmm. Like a recommendation? Yes. Write a recommendation to move forward? Or? Yes. That's all we're being asked to do is to. I'm assuming, Tim, when you say the delay is missing information on the economics, has the information been asked for? I mean, I'm. So, who's collecting the information? I guess. I believe the town council has been having some sort of a, uh, what is it, special group or, like consulting to get information from the haulers. And they also, um, I don't know what, 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 what was the process there, but the main question which came out in the last discussion was the economics of it. <clears throat> so adding this regulation is going to actually add to the cost of recycling, but it was unsure if it's going to reduce it or is it going to create some sort of undue burden for those people who cannot afford it. And that's where the town council, I believe, had formed a uh, committee or something oh, to yeah. look for this stuff at low data. I guess the question is, you know, if it, if we're just asking, if we're just recommending that they move on it, 
it seems reasonable to me, given that it's been two years in process. I think um, checking on the status might be a good option on where they are, rather than developing a. No, is that record, uh, that you know, our information packet? I've read all this stuff about it, and now I can't remember exactly who's doing what. But I think, you know, that 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 survey showed that then Darcy spoke to this that you know that people are paying five like a. Uh, average of five hundred fifty dollars. There's a lot much transparency. I don't know if the next step is kind of a request for proposals to the haulers or um, to see. I think we just. You're right. We don't know. There's. There, we don't know that part, and um, I think just the idea of trying to move it forward to get to the point where the the town council can make a decision is a good idea. Um, Cause I think then it comes back to us to uh, adjust our trash recycling kind of, we have regulations in this yes. area. So it's, you know, it's, it's quite the process. I guess the question is, is it economically feasible? And in many towns and cities it actually br brought down the costs to have a, a single contract through the town as opposed to contracts for individuals with the haulers. Um, but I did not understand the structure of the pricing there. I, I mean, it, it almost looked like everyone would pay what would be considered the, you know, the transfer station fee level and people and other, and then you could also contract to, get pickup it's curbside pickup but i i may misunderstand that completely so um so it, it will you know i don't know that we need to understand that right now that's I was that, just going to say i mean it's not it's not a decision ultimately that we're making it no, i think we just no. have to decide if we're in support of it i right. think that it makes sense to yeah. move to to do what we can to assist in moving it along i mean the the town council doesn't have to listen to our recommendation, right? Right. Nope. <laughs> no. No. So what we're asked to do, and I can make a motion, that the Board of Health asks the town council to adopt the zero waste, zero waste Amherst proposal oh wait a minute wait a minute well to minute. act on adopting to right? act on adopting so we're asking the board of health uh, um, the town council asking the town council to act on adopting the waste hauler proposal that was brought forth by zero waste amherst so that it can be in this summer so that it can be implemented in January 2024. That's all. So can we, does someone want to make a motion on that? I'll make the motion. Okay. And that we're asking the town council to move forward. Uh, may have it second. I can second it. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay, so we're going to vote on it. Maureen? Yes. Premila? Yes. Lauren? Yes. She's in the chat. Yes, thank you. Um, Tim? Aye. And Nancy? Aye. Okay, so it's unanimous. We are going to ask the town council to move forward on that. Thank you. New business. Oh, new business. I put this in. I just wanted to make people aware of two things that the there are a lot of bills, house bills um, on an act banning semi-automatic firearms, an act 
increasing penalties for illegal sale and possession of firearms, an act to clarify the prosecution of illegal guns, and an act requiring live practice um, on fire, uh, for firearm licensure. And I just wanted you, um, and the Senate has an act to strengthen gun control. I just wanted to let you know that there's, this is going on on the state level because we did have Scott Livingston come to talk to us about um, uh, gun safety. That, so I just wanted to let you know that. The other thing that's important for us as Board of Health members to know that the Senate and the House have, they're called SAFE, it's State Action for Public Health Excellence. And both the House and the Senate have an act relative to accelerating improvements to the local regional public health system to address disparities in delivering of public health services. And this has been an ongoing process from the state starting in 2019 with the um, blueprint on uh, public health excellence and grants moving for regionalization and sharing of um, services. And I just wanted you to um, be aware that these are going on um, in the state level. And that's the only reason. Anybody have any questions on those? And the other new business is the Board of Health Succession. Um, Jen said there are applicants to be on the board, but um, um, my term expires and Lauren's expires on June 30th and you're gonna to need to have a new chair for July 1st or sooner if someone wants to do it in June. So I don't know what your thoughts for Maureen Premois and Tim. I'm still the newbie, so <laughs> I don't think I'd be appropriate. <laughs> so Maure Maureen, it's between you and Tim. Um, who's going to be chair either in June or definitely in July? Maureen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have concerns about that in terms of what one I could bring to the table, but also even though I'm retired and I, if, you know, <laughs> you guys are both working, I have a bunch of things that are going to be complicating my life in big chunks of this year. Um, and so you could be chair and then uh, if you can't be there, you ask someone else to, to be the to acting be, chair. Yeah. yeah. I wondered about a real rotation system or something like that. And I well, guess yeah, years ago, it was supposed to be every year. It was supposed to be a different chair, but somehow that never happens. <laughs> yeah. So is this something that gets voted on or it just gets? Uh, well, you, you've got to decide for the July meeting. <laughs> yeah. And then also to keep, I, I keep asking Jen, but to make sure that the town uh, proceeds to have two new people for July. Because last year uh, it, it dragged on in Premola. You just came in, it was December, correct? Uh, yeah, even though I applied in August. Yeah, it, somehow they, they dragged and dragged and dragged and dragged and I kept asking. And then all of a sudden I, I said, oh, the interviews, can you do this tomorrow? It was right. like, like, bam. Um, so I, I, I'm, and we can just keep asking Jen, uh, otherwise there'll just be three of you. And if someone is sick or something happens, you're not gonna have a quorum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I've been mentioning this for several meetings. So um, Jen is very much aware of it and somehow the town processes go slow. 
um, this? I can say I'll be the chair for the July <laughs> meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and then maybe we can talk about it again because um, I, you can decide to have co-chairs and you can alternate you can you can yeah. do whatever you want I mean, yeah I you would do what I would like want. to not be on my own with this because I like I said I especially for a chunk of time in the fall uh, I uh, I'm going to be out of town every week for at least a couple of days um yeah. and so you can decide to say oh we're going to have co-chairs mm -hmm. you can do that all right or chair and yeah um director's report there's no director's report topics not anticipated by the chair 48 hours to the meeting somehow i slipped up and we didn't have the community assessment under all business, but the students are going to be presenting the community assessment data at the June meeting. And it's going to be about a 45 minute, about 30 minute presentation and 15 minutes for question and answer. Um, Steve George has sent a letter requesting a ban on gas mowers in the town. And I think we should defer that to, um, July or August. Steve's away this month, and I believe he's away in June. And I think until you have a full complement of people on the board, you 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 mm -hmm. can't take that up. Um, and then um, there's just something I want to throw out for uh, us and and you to think about. Um, we do have a um, statement on racism and public health. And there's been a lot of issue nationally and then locally, and we don't have any information. It, it's all out and it's going out for um, um, some review, but in the graphic, there's an issue on, <laughs> lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, plus um, issues in the school system. I, I'm not going to take on the school system, but the board might want to think of putting out a statement on, um, and the American Public Health calls it sexual and gender minorities, but you might, the board might want to think of making a statement on um, sexual and gender minorities and public health um, <laughs> in the upcoming year. Um, I, I don't know if people have any comments on it, but um, I'm sure you're aware of the, gra uh, the article and the graphic and it's made um, front page news and NPR news too. Uh, there's an issue in the middle school, but I, as I said, I, that's separate from, I think, a statement uh, on LGBTQ plus, or you can put in parentheses, sexual and gender minorities and public health. So that I just wanted to throw out. Um, and so there's nothing in, else i don't Nancy, know i have a question yes um so are you writing the letter to uh, uh, how is this letter being generated the letter to to the town council yes i'll write it okay i'll write it i'll write it tomorrow morning <laughs> Thank you. and um any other comments questions No, if not, may have a motion to adjourn. Our next meeting is June 8th at 5.30. Motion, motion to adjourn. And second? I'll second. second. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded. Adjourn, Premila. We're voting. Aye. Aye. <laughs> Maureen. Aye. Tim. Aye. Lauren. Hi, Lauren. 
Okay. <laughs> Great. Nancy, I. Okay, so thank you very much. And we'll see you on June 8th. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.